Welcome back to Logo Legends, the podcast on sports teams and their logos, branding, and identities throughout history. My name is Kasabi. Thanks for listening along. This is episode 7 of Logo Legends. New episodes are every Thursday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and my personal YouTube channel, although we will be taking a short break for the holidays in between Christmas and New Year's Eve, so new episode in a couple weeks after this one. So before we go into more of a team-by-team case basis in January of 2023, I wanted to go over something that also went along with the recent topics we've been talking about regarding a team's logos and uniforms and how important those can be to the fans and also to the cultural significance of the team itself. Logos and uniforms can affect how fans view your product. And one thing I also think kind of gets lost in our consciousness is the stadium name or sponsor of the stadium. It's something that we don't really think about other than like, you know, occasionally thinking that it might be good or bad, but it really does get into the public lexicon and it's a very generational thing as well. We all have our favorite and least favorite stadium names, but naming rights tend to be something that's done over the course of a decade or two. It's not like a logo or a uniform that you can change after a couple years because the public didn't view it very favorably. This is something you have to commit to for a very long time. So picking a new stadium sponsor, I think, can really just change the trajectory of how people view your team and your brand more than any logo or uniform really could. Unless your rebrand is just completely abysmal, but we haven't seen too much of that so far. So obviously there are some caveats to naming deals. There could be some instances where the naming rights are broken free of in terms of a bankruptcy like we saw with Sports Authority Field. Uh, We also had the dot-com bubble burst and the 2008 economic crisis that led to some sponsors going away from the stadium they were sponsoring. But first, a brief summary of why stadiums are named in the first place. It wasn't too common in the early 20th century, but there were a few stadiums that did it. There are some stadiums that still exist today that were named after a company to some degree. So we have Fenway Park and Wrigley Field. They weren't directly purchased by the company. Fenway was a realty company that was also associated with the stadium. And Wrigley Field was bought by the Wrigley Company, which makes chewing gum. So it wasn't like a complete sponsorship. It just happened to be owned by the Wrigley family. So, of course, their names are historical in this point in time. We won't really see any opportunities for stadiums like those to offer up naming rights unless they're in some very dire straits. I I wouldn't imagine it, though, with those two examples. Around the 1950s, though, there were a lot of stadiums that started to offer out their naming rights as a part of driving revenue or, in some cases, kind of get back some of the costs sunk into renovations and building. One of the earliest examples would be the original Bush Stadium in St. Louis. This happened in 1953, I want to say. And Bush Stadium is a very popular company to the area with the Bush manufacturing plant and the beer. I mean, it's still used today, even in the new Bush Stadium in St. Louis. So there are a few stadiums out there that don't have a sponsored name. There are some that are starting to lose their holdout pattern. So Paul Brown Stadium in Cincinnati, for instance, just got changed to Paycor Stadium this uh, this last year. So some of these changes and some of these references can be generational. I don't know too many people that are going to be calling it Paycor Stadium even in a few years after it's kind of sunk into the public's consciousness a bit more. And it's always going to be Paul Brown Stadium to some extent. I mean, if you ask anybody on the south side of Chicago where the White Sox play, you're sure to get a variety of answers. So you might get Comiskey Park, U.S. Cellular, uh, Guaranteed Rate Field, which is what the current name is. The oldest of the bunch, Comiskey Park, went away in 2003, but I still know some friends and family in the area that still refer to it as such. So recently there's been a lot more stadiums that have been popping up new since the renovation costs have been going up and what was used to be thought for a stadium to be lasting about 30 to 50 years has been getting closer to 20 to 30. A lot of teams just don't really want to sink into the cost of kind of updating their stadium to something that was just recently built from scratch and has all this new cutting edge like super huge like fan promotional areas, things that kind of enhance the fan experience. So this has led to more new stadiums forming out of the blue. There's new architectural designs that people want to try out and are just kind of like ooing and aahing the public crowds. And it's just kind of this push where, you know, the the more into it you get, the more you sink into building a multi-billion dollar stadium, putting all the bells and whistles on it, the more likely that your stadium is going to be the golden goose of the league that you're in. And it's going to be the top choice for like a Super Bowl or some other events in that area. So as a result, there's a lot of corporate sponsors that are just salivating at the opportunity to get their brand associated with this crown jewel of the league. They want their name to be out there with this stadium that everybody's going nuts over. 
And this can lead to some quite ridiculous stadium names. I mean, I've already said guaranteed rate field, which is an absolute mouthful. It's gargantuan and I hate it. Then there's Smoothie King Center in New Orleans, Crypto.com Arena in Los Angeles that replaced the Staples Center, Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle because that's Amazon's way of trying to feel like they're not a complete stain on the environment. What really bugs me, though, is a lot of these stadium names that were actually local to the area are being replaced. So we've talked a few times about Miller Park being renamed to American Family Field because notably Miller is a part of Milwaukee. It's actually manufactured in Milwaukee, the very city that the Brewers play in. And your team is literally called the Brewers. Like, how are you not going to have a beer company as your sponsor? So I guess American Family Insurance is based out of Madison, Wisconsin. You can kind of make the assumption that they're still local to the Milwaukee area by proxy. I mean, it's a couple hours away. But even more egregious than that is the new Pittsburgh Steelers stadium name, Acrisure Stadium. I, I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. Acrisure is another insurance company and real estate service that kicked out Heinz, which is a brand that's local to Pennsylvania. This one might be so bad that I can guarantee you that nobody is going to be calling it Acrisure Stadium. Not just the people in Pennsylvania, but like continental U.S. I don't know anybody who's going to be calling it anything other than Heinz Field. Heinz is still present at the Steelers games, but they've had to remove the two giant ketchup bottles near the main scoreboard. And uh, they're still the official sponsor of the Red Zone, which I kind of find funny because it's a ketchup brand. But Acrisure ensured that they'd be the main sponsor for the next 15 years at a rate of $20 million per season. A brand from Grand Rapids, Michigan is now the main sponsor of the Pittsburgh Steelers. That just doesn't seem right to me as a, you know, leveled person. <laughs> So a lesson to stadium brand sponsors. If you're going to try and take over a beloved franchise's new naming rights, at least try to localize yourself. I mean, sure, I'm from Minnesota and there's two stadiums here named after Target, but it's embedded in the culture here. People don't mind that there's two arenas or stadiums that are named after the Target brand here. Ford Field in Detroit, Michigan makes a ton of sense for a city who prides itself on building cars. It just makes sense. If you're a smoothie company from Coppell, Texas, and you name a stadium after yourselves in New Orleans, I am going to laugh at you. If your company name on the side of the building is longer than the Cleveland Guardians World Series drought, I am going to laugh at you. But the fact is, a lot of corporate sponsors just don't care, and that's the landscape that we're in right now. I would not be surprised if more stadiums take the same route that we've seen with some of these more recent examples over the next couple decades. But what are your thoughts? Are there any stadium names that I might have missed as part of the examples that I gave in this podcast episode? Or do you also see the stadium landscape for the naming rights changing into even more ridiculous patterns? Let me know in the comment section if you're watching on my personal YouTube channel. Again, I have visualizations on every YouTube video on my personal channel. That's K-A-S-A-B-E. But if you are listening on Apple or Spotify, I appreciate you. For being here for episode 7, again, we're going to take another week off for the holidays between Christmas and New Year's, so new episodes in a couple weeks. We'll have a bit more team history-oriented episodes going forward. If there's a team that you'd want to learn a little bit more about, be sure to tweet at me, at Kasabi Compiles, that's K-A-S-A-B-E, and then Compiles with a K. So take care for now, happy holidays, and we'll see you next time. This is Kasabi from Logo Legends, signing off for 2022.